Who was working with the web in 2008? Please raise your hands. Okay. So do you guys remember what happened in 2008? Like some big deal, some guy named uh, HTML5 arrived. Uh, so this was w the first time that the HTML5 spec arrived. And um, everything just went crazy, right? When HTML5 arrived, you know, it was uh, this thing that will save all of us. Uh, and on 2009, um, there was this interview with Ian Hickson, the guy that uh, wrote the, the specification, and he said that HTML5 would, would be ready in 2022. And I don't know if you remember this, but uh, like just the tech world and the, the media, they portrayed HTML5 as this thing that would be ready in like 10 years from now or much more than this. And, and you as a developer, you probably thought that, so why am I, I'm just like studying this thing if it's not gonna uh, be ready uh, very soon. So that, that was like really complicated, really messed up. Uh, in 2010, um, Steve Jobs wrote this open letter saying that Flash was not gonna run on, on iOS devices anymore, and then HTML5 was the answer uh, if you wanted to build uh, web applications for iOS. And that just like, the market went crazy when this thing happened. Uh, I don't know if you were working with ActionScript at that time, working with the Flash platform, uh, but I remember lots of people just like going crazy and like switching jobs and, and doing all, all those kinds of things. Uh, in 2011, HTML5 got this amazing logo. And now HTML5 <laughs> was like definitely a superhero, you know? Uh, it was the thing that was gonna save all of us and uh, kill Flash, kill all those uh, crazy plugins. Uh, and as everything that starts to get popular uh, in 2012, uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, gave this interview saying that our biggest mistake was batting too much on HTML5. Uh, so that was really crazy. Uh, a lot of people uh, started to think that HTML5 was not the answer. HTML5 was something that you should, shouldn't be working on. Uh, but, you know, those, those kinds of bad press happens. And uh, later on, in 2013, people continued working with HTML5 and creating games, creating, creating all those kinds of things, all kinds of applications. In 2014, uh, this specification went to the recommendation status. So that means that the W3C went through all this, the steps of a specification can, can go with, and it was ready. And now what? Uh, HTML5 is ready. And what should we do next, you know? Um, so you probably heard about SVG, Canvas, local storage, WebRTC, video, audio, drag and drop, geolocation, all those amazing technologies that came with HTML5. But what now? What happened between 2014 and 2016 that doesn't include React or Webpack or Browserify? What happened with the, the, the web platform? And there was a bunch of, of things. And that's the idea of this talk, to show some of the APIs, sh show some of uh, the things that happened. Uh, so we'll start with page visibility. So this API, it's basically a very simple way to ask if a, a page is currently visible for the user or not. So in the past, you could use events like on blur, on focus, on a page, but that was like really a bad idea, it was just a hack because if you had like two tabs on the same page and one, uh, two windows on the, on, the, on, the same wi on the same screen and you would click on one, the other would be on blur. So that was not a, a, a bad, uh, that was not a good idea. So they came up with this specification just to know uh, if a page was visible or not. And the way it works, it's very simple. You add an event listener and then uh, if it's hidden, you do something, if it's visible, you can do another thing. Uh, so that's pretty easy. Uh, the specification uh, evolved a little bit. Uh, one of the things they're saying right now is uh, there's this new property called visibility state. So uh, the idea is that you can identify other kinds of uh, 
status of a page. So there's a new attribute called uh, link rel prefetch, prefetch, something like that, and then you can prefetch a page. So now you can, uh, using this API, you can identify it's, if the page is pre-rendering or not. And same thing if it's hidden, if it's visible, you can do something on the page. So the browser support is pretty good. It's amazing, actually. Uh, you can use it nowadays. And, but the question is where to use it. Uh, and I'm just gonna give you uh, like this example. Uh, imagine you have like a player on your page. This is a video player. And once you start the video, you can show like feedback on the screen. Uh, on your fav icon, for example, if you open a new tab, that page is not visible anymore, so you can pause the video, uh, and once it backs again, you can play the video. So you can do this kind of experience for the user. Uh, if you're building a game, that's a very good idea because you don't want the user to go to other pages and then that weird sound keeps playing. Uh, that's very annoying, actually. Uh, and, but this is also a bad user experience. Imagine if YouTube does this, so that'll be a mess because people will like be hearing a, a video in one tab and if you go to the other, it will pause the video. So it really depends on what you're building. Uh, online state is an, another one. So nowadays we can identify if a user has connection or not. That's basically it. Uh, and you can use this uh, attribute called uh, navigator.online. Uh, if it's true, you can do something. If it's uh, false, you can do another thing. Uh, and you can also listen for those two events called offline and online. And that's pretty much it, you know. Uh, that's the only thing, you, the only information you can have from the network. Uh, it is good for a lot of cases, but sometimes you need more uh, more things. Uh, the browser support is pretty good as well for this one. And uh, as I said, that there are more things that could be exposed uh, for a web page, and that's why this network information API exists. So this is a different thing. This is something that it's being uh, written and being developed. But the idea is that you can uh, identify things like uh, if the user has a 3G connection or if it's a Wi-Fi connection, uh, how is the download speed, how is the upload speed, those kinds of things. So if you're building a video player or something that is more robust, uh, imagine you could just know if the user is using 3G and then you just decrease some of the, the images that you're using. I don't know, there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, and where to use this? So I have this app called DevSpace. It's a tweet deck for, for GitHub. Uh, so I just created like a very similar UI, uh, just like TweetDeck, and where you have columns, and every single column uh, is a GitHub stream, you know. And uh, the GitHub API is amazing, but you cannot do real time with the GitHub API. So you have to do pooling, or that means that you have to, from time to time, uh, send a HTTP request to the API and get the information. So from one minute to another minute, you just send uh, a request for, for the GitHub API. The problem is, if the user goes offline, then he would have like this app that is not like updating or anything like that. So imagine if you just like turn off the Wi-Fi and then show some, some user feedback saying, hey, your internet is offline, and if you connect again, uh, to the Wi-Fi, you can show something like, okay, you are connected again, and now you have some new results. So those are some like smaller things that you can do to improve the user experience, uh, and it's very useful. If you are building a dashboard uh, where you're fetching information uh, from time to time, uh, it's important for the user to know that that information is up to date. Uh, the other one is the vibration API. So this, this is very nice because we are used to have like visual feedbacks on your phones, on our computers. Uh, we can have some audio feedbacks as well, but there's not a form of tactile feedback. And uh, there's, a, there's some really nice things you can do with that. The API is super simple also. You call like 
navigator that vibrate, and here's the value in, in milliseconds, so you can pass just like 1,000 milliseconds if you want uh, to vibrate for a second. Uh, and you can also pass some patterns. So you should pass like an array, and you, you say that, okay, for 400 uh, milliseconds, you can vibrate, and then you wait 300, and then you vibrate for another three, 300, and then you wait. So you can build those, those things, and you can also stop the vibration if it's running. So like, you can imagine some crazy people working with this. Uh, they did like the Super Mario theme, uh, where it would vibrate, and according to the, to the song, the Star Wars theme, the Google Power Rangers, that's my favorite one. Uh, and uh, that's, that's really crazy, but that's the, some of the things people do. I don't know the reason, but they do. Uh, so the, the support is not the, the best one, but it, but it works, and if it doesn't, it doesn't change the, the experience. Uh, and here are some ideas on where to use it. Um, for games, this is a very straightforward example. Uh, I don't know if you remember this game from Windows 95, I guess. Uh, someone ported to, to JavaScript, and, and I played this game on my phone, and I was just like playing with that, and then when it crashed it, uh, it vibrates. So this is like a very small thing on the, on the, on the user experience, but it, it was really, really good, you know? Uh, I felt the difference. It was a more immersive experience. Some other examples, some more uh, tangible examples, is a form validation. Uh, when the user submits a, a form, you could just like vibrate if it's invalid. Uh, and again, you have the the, the visual, uh, you have the visual uh, feedback. So why not uh, putting this extra thing that will uh, make the experience better? Uh, you can also detect the device orientation. So that's, that's really insane. You can actually detect the physical orientation of, of a device. Um, and the way you do it, it it's you again just listen for event, uh, and it, then you have those three informations on your callback, the gamma, the beta, and the alpha. And if you just like, this is a, a real code from an example that I will show. Uh, you can just like have an image on your page you get this image, you listen for this event, and then you get those information, and then you can combine CSS transforms with that information. So you can just like rotate your element according to the physical orientation. So let me show you how this works. Okay, so this is my webcam. And I have a very conservative demo here. Uh, this is Trump's face. And then you can just rotate uh, and then uh, according to my physical orientation, it will change. Uh, so that's pretty awesome, uh, rotating Trump's face. Um, but uh, how is the browser support? Uh, so that's pretty good as well. And um, you can use it nowadays. Uh, in where to use it. You know, you're not gonna rotate Trump's face all the time. <laughs> so what are the possibilities? Um, I don't know if you use the Facebook app, but this new feature, the 360 photos, uh, or the 360 videos, uh, this is something you could use, you know? As the user uh, changes the physical orientation of your device, you can just uh, do something like this, you know? Um, so that's really, not, re that's really nice. The other thing is messing up with your clipboard. I know you all love this. When you copy something from a page, it puts some other content on your clipboard. Uh, you can do that. There's some new APIs to do that. Um, and you can do like copying, paste, pasting, and, and cutting. Um, and this is now real. Uh, in the past, you had to use Flash. Uh, this, is, this was probably the most famous uh, library uh, called Zero Clipboard, but it relied on Flash. And I remember using it, uh, or I remember having this use case where I needed copy to clipboard, and I just like, I refused to use this API, th this library, because it had Flash. Uh, but now you can do it. And uh, you have like three steps to, to do copying to clipboard. 
Uh, the first one, this is a, a browser uh, requirement. Uh, you have to uh, have like some user interaction. You cannot uh, trigger an event, you cannot fake an event. You have to actually have the user clicking. So we can just uh, add a listener for a click and then we need to do two separate things. One is selecting the content and the other one is actually copying it. So this is the first and then we have this select function where we imagine we have an input on your on our application and then we we need to select the content of this input. You can programmatically select content from an input. You can just focus this and then you just select the entire content. So now this is exactly like selecting with your mouse but we are doing this programmat programmatically. Uh, and then finally, we can copy the content. So we just use this document.exact command copy. And now that's it. Uh, if there's an error, we have this try catch that can, can get it. And there's some other things, some, some events that you can listen, like copy, cut, paste. Uh, but the browser support for those events, it's, it's pretty bad. Uh, and the first time I, I saw this API, uh, I was really, really disappointed. Uh, it was so complicated. Uh, it was so bad. Uh, so I decided to create this Clipboard.js library. Uh, it went pretty viral. I don't know if you guys heard about it. Uh, but I, I would say that this is the best way to do it nowadays. That's, that's the easiest way nowadays uh, to make a uh, copy to Clipboard. Um, the browser support, uh, it's good. Uh, there's just this little guy over here, the new IE. Um, and I'm really mad that it's not supported yet because people open issues all the time saying, hey, it's not supported, I'm, I'm, it's not my fault. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it's almost there. The, the, the Safari technology preview, uh, it already implemented, but they are waiting for the iOS release. So Apple has this crazy release cycle, so they're waiting for that. Uh, and where to use it. I guess those are the, the most simple use cases. You probably use GitHub already, and when you want to clone some repo, you can just click, click on this button, and then it's on your clipboard. Um, or if you're using the Bootstrap uh, documentation, you can just click on Copy to Clipboard, and instead of copying the entire block of code, you can just uh, click on this button. And this actually is the Alpha 4 documentation, which uses Clipboard.js. Um, the other one is ambient light. So this one is crazy. You can actually get the ambient light and capture the light sens sensitivity, you know? And, and you can just pretty much know if it's, why, if it's light or if it's dark. You can do those things. Uh, the API, again, pretty simple. Adamant listener, device light, you have a callback, and then you get the value. And the value, they have this uh, weird uh, property, uh, not, not the property, the, the metric, it's called looks. I didn't know it existed, but it, it's a thing. It's how they measure light. Uh, so you have this value. And I created this example. It's a really friendly example. No big deal. Uh, we have this, actually, okay. Yeah, so we have this friendly ghost, and now it's, there's some light here because it captures the webcam. But if I turn off the lights, <laughs> if I turn it on. That's crazy, that's a crazy example. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you, you can do those things. Um, this API is changing. Uh, they are now uh, creating this new one called generic sensor. So they are putting some, some other APIs inside of that. And one of them is the ambient light. So the API will look like this in the future. Uh, so you have to like instantiate a new ambient light sensor, start the sensor and then uh, you have uh, events to detect if the, the images, if the ambient light changed or not. So I think there will be some, some browser uh, security things, you know, those flags to authorize because nowadays it doesn't have. 
Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it's not well uh, supported. Uh, it's just on, on Firefox and Chrome, so, uh, Chrome Canary, uh, which was, I was using. And where to use this? You know, I usually show this example and people are like, okay, that's really, really crazy, but uh, what it, what's the, the real use case for this? Um, imagine you're going outside and then you have this, uh, this huge light on your phone and then you cannot read. Uh, so this is something very common. Uh, what if we could just detect that and say to the user, hey, I noticed you're on a very bright uh, place. Uh, do you want me to tweak the, the contrast of the application so you can read it better? So this is one thing you can do. Or if you're on your bed, I guess everybody went through for, for that situation already. Uh, you can just say, hey, I noticed you're in a dark room. Uh, do you want me to just change my UI to a dark theme? Bam. So, so that's a very nice uh, user experience uh, kind of thing that you can do. Uh, the other one is the battery status. So now, now the, the web pages can detect the, how, how, you, how your battery is. You know? If I disconnect my computer, I know if it's charging or not. Uh, if my battery is in 60% or 70%, you can detect that for both mobile and desktop devices. Uh, this one is a little bit different. It's more like a promise-based API. Uh, you can get the, the battery from the navigator, and then you can uh, you have the, the battery object, and then you can uh, detect events from there. Uh, and now I can detect if the level of my battery changed or not and, showing, uh, and show that information. Uh, the browser support is not very good, but okay, it's getting there. Um, and where to use this. So do you guys play Pokemon Go? Yes. Yes? How is the battery for Pokemon Go? Not good, right? Imagine if Pokemon Go was written in, on the web. And uh, imagine you could uh, just put some uh, information saying, hey, you got like 23 minutes remaining uh, to catch Pokemons, uh, go recharge. Or, like, or imagine you have like uh, a dashboard or you know those really long forms that there's like tons of inputs that you need to fill out? Uh, imagine if you could detect if the battery is dying and tell the user, hey, I know the battery is dying. I'm going to save this information on the local storage. Uh, so there are plenty of use cases, plenty of ideas uh, that you can play with. And there is so much more things going on on the web. There's web components. And inside this umbrella, there's like templates, shadow DOM, HTML imports, custom elements, so many stuff. Uh, you have progressive web apps, service workers, push notifications, uh, web Bluetooth, web NFC. There are so, so many APIs. Uh, and I'm just going to show those, uh, those last three. Those are more for the future. Uh, the first one is WebAssembly. So now we have this low-level programming language that we can put it on the web. And the use cases for that are those really high-performance applications. Uh, the browser support is not very good. It's under development. Everything will probably change in like a week, a month, or a year. So I wouldn't say go play with that or put it in production. You can play with that, but not in production. Uh, and you can do some amazing things like this. So check out the performance for this. It's I don't know how you feel about this, but like this kind of thing running on the web, it's pretty insane. Um, and we also have web VR, which you can connect devices like the Oculus Rift, the Google Cardboard, and have this whole immersive experience with VR. The browser support is getting there uh, as well, uh, but we already uh, uh, saw like so many good examples for web VR. And I would definitely recommend a frame for, for doing that nowadays. Uh, and we also have the GamePad API. So now you can connect a, a game controller uh, using USB and then playing with your controller uh, on your application. Uh, so the API, it's uh, you detect this GamePad connected event, 
and then you can have plenty of gamepads connected. So we're just gonna get the, the, the first uh, element on this array, and then uh, we, can, we can get information like the ID of this gamepad, uh, how many buttons it has, all those things. Uh, and after you connected the gamepad, uh, there, are not, there are no events for when you clicked on a button, do this. So you have to use request animation frame. So we can uh, use request animation frame, which if you are already building a game, you probably are using this already. So you, we can call this function, uh, this game loop function, using request animation frame, and then we can detect how many buttons it pressed or not, which was the button that pressed and then moves uh, like my character on the game to one side or to the other. Uh, and there's some really, really nice additions to, the, to this specification uh, that is coming, like uh, including those web VR uh, controllers is one of the things and uh, gamepads that has touch enabled on it. So that's pretty rad. Uh, the browser support, it's not bad. You, you can probably use it nowadays. You can always fall back to the, to the keyboard. It's not something that it's gonna ruin your entire uh, experience. And I created this Nintendo emulator for the stock. So we basically have some, does anybody has like a PlayStation controller or Xbox controller? No? Okay, I have one, but it's, <laughs> but it's a Nintendo controller. Okay, so let me connect this thing. And let's play Super Mario. Okay. Let's see if it's working. Okay, yeah. Where are you? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just gonna lose it. <laughs> no, we're not going back to, to the ghost. Okay, <laughs> so like the web is this whole magic place, right? There's so many things uh, going on and, it, and it's just crazy. Like every day there's a new tool, every day there's a new library, every day there's a new API. Uh, but it's, it's just magic. Uh, and like m most of the times we are just like going to work, doing the same thing or we're doing new things, but it's not like completely different from what we do already. So, you know, the advice that we heard earlier about side projects, I think that's really, really uh, a good advice uh, because we're often on our comfort zone doing the things we are used to, but there's a lot of things uh, on this magic uh, side where you can learn more, you can experiment more. And uh, you guys already did the first step because you already came to this conference, so I'm assuming you want to get out of the comfort zone, uh, but it will require like tomorrow, Sunday, whatever, you know, uh, playing with that, working with those things. Uh, it doesn't need to be any web API, it can be anything, Webpack, whatever you wanna choose. Uh, but yeah, that, that's my message for you, and thank you so much.